Chapter Nine, Part One of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Nine, Turning on the Foe, Part One. Harry was awakened at the first shoot of dawn by the sound of trumpets. It was now approaching the last of May, and the cold nights had long since passed. A warm sun was fast showing its edge in the east, and, bathing his face at a brook, and snatching a little breakfast, he was ready. Stonewall Jackson was already up, and his colored servant was holding little sorrel for him. The army was fast forming into line. The new men of Ewell resolved to become as famous foot cavalry as those who had been with Jackson all along. Ewell himself, full of enthusiasm, and already devoted to his chief, was riding among them, and whenever he spoke to one of them he cocked his head on one side in the peculiar manner that was habitual with him. Now and then, as the sun grew warmer, he took off his hat, and his bald head gleamed under the yellow rays. "'Which way do you think we're going?' said the young staff officer, George Dalton, to Harry. Dalton was a quiet youth, with a good deal of the Puritan about him, and Harry liked him. "'I'm not thinking about it at all,' replied Harry, with a laugh. "'I've quit trying to guess what our general is going to do. But I fancy that he means to lead us against the enemy. He has the numbers now.' "'I suppose you're right,' said Dalton. "'I've been trying to guess all along, but I think I'll give it up now, and merely follow where the general leads.' The bugles blew, the troops rapidly fell into line, and marched northward along the turnpike. The Creole band began to play again one of those lilting waltz tunes, and the speed of the men increased, their feet rising and falling swiftly to the rhythm of the galloping air. Jackson, who was near the head of the column, looked back, and Harry saw a faint smile pass over his grim face. He saw the value of the music. I never heard such airs in our Presbyterian church, said Dalton to Harry. But this isn't a church. No, it isn't. But those Creole tunes suit here. They put fresh life into me. Same here. And they help the men, too. Look how gay they are. Up went the shining sun. The brilliant blue light shot with gold spread from horizon to horizon. Little white clouds of vapor tinted at the edges with gold from the sun floated here and there. It was beautiful May over all the valley. White dust flew from the turnpike under the feet of so many marching men and horses and the wheels of cannon. Suddenly the Georgia troops that had suffered so severely at McDowell began to sing a verse from the stars and bars, and gradually the whole column joined in. Now Georgia marches to the front, and close beside her come her sisters by the Mexique Sea with pealing trump and drum till answering back from hill and glen, the rallying cry afar, a nation hoists the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. It was impossible not to feel emotion. The face of the most solemn Presbyterian of them all flushed and his eyes glowed. Now the band, that wonderful band of the Acadians, was playing the tune, and the mighty chorus rolled and swelled across the fields. Harry's heart throbbed hard. He was with the South his own South, and he was swayed wholly by feeling. The Arcadians were leading the army. Harry saw Jackson whispering something to a staff officer. The officer galloped forward and spoke to Taylor, the commander of the Louisiana troops. Instantly, the Acadians turned sharply from the turnpike and walked in a diagonal line through the fields. The whole army followed, and they marched steadily northward and eastward. Harry had another good and close view of the Massanuttons, now one vast mass of dark green foliage, and it caused his thoughts to turn to Shepard. He had no doubt that the wary and astute northern scout was somewhere near, watching the march of Stonewall. He had secured a pair of glasses of his own, and he scanned the fields and forests now for a sight of him and his bold horsemen, but he saw no blue uniforms, merely farmers and their wives and children, shouting with joy at the sight of Jackson, eager to give him information, and eager to hide it from Banks. 
but Harry was destined to have more than another view of the Massamuttons. Jackson marched steadily for four days, crossing the Massamuttons at the defile, and coming down into the eastern valley. The troops were joyous throughout the journey, although they had not the least idea for what they were destined, and Ewell's men made good their claim to a place of equal honor in the foot cavalry. They were now in the division of the great valley known as the Lure, and only when they stopped did Harry and his comrades of the staff learn that the northern army under Kenley was only ten miles away at Front Royal. The preceding night had been one of great confidence, even of light-heartedness in Washington. The worn and melancholy president felt that a triumphant issue of the war was at hand. The Secretary of War was more than sanguine, and the people in the city joyfully expected speedy news of the fall of Richmond. McClellan was advancing with an overwhelming force on the southern capital, and the few regiments of Jackson were lost somewhere in the mountains. In the west all things were going well under Grant. It was only a few who, recognizing that the army of Jackson was lost to the northern eyes, began to ask questions about it. But they were laughed down. Jackson had too few men to do any harm, wherever he might be. Nobody suspected that at dawn Jackson, with a strong force, would be only a little more than threescore miles from the Union capital itself. Even Banks himself, who was only half that distance from the southern army, did not dream that it was coming. When the sun swung clear that May morning, there was a great elation in this army, which had been lost to its enemies for days, and which the unknowing despised. They ate a good breakfast, and then, as the Creole band began to play its waltzes again, they advanced swiftly on Front Royal. "'We'll be attacking in two hours,' said Dalton. "'In less time than that, I'm thinking,' said Harry. "'Look how the men are speeding it up.' The band ceased suddenly. Harry surmised that it had been stopped, in order to suppress noise as much as possible, now that they were approaching the enemy. Cheering and loud talking also were stopped, and they heard now the heavy beat of footsteps, horses and men, and the rumble of vehicles, cannon and wagons. The morning was bright and hot. A haze of heat hung over the mountains, and to Harry the valley was more beautiful and picturesque than ever. He had again flitting feelings of melancholy that it should be torn so ruthlessly by war. If Shepard and other northern scouts were near, they were lax that morning. Not a soul in the garrison at Front Royal dreamed of Jackson's swift approach. They were soon to have a terrible awakening. Harry saw Jackson raise the visor of his old cap a little, and he saw the eyes beneath it gleam. We must be near Front Royal, he said to Dalton. It's just beyond the woods there. It's not more than half a mile away. The army halted a moment, and Jackson sent forward a long line of skirmishers through the wood. Sherburne's cavalry was to ride just behind them, and he dispatched Harry and Dalton with the captain. At the first sound of the firing, the whole army would rush upon Front Royal. The skirmishers, five hundred strong, pressed forward through the wood. They were sun-browned, eager fellows, with everyone carrying a rifle, and all were sharpshooters. It seemed to Harry that the skirmishers were through the wood in an instant, like a force of Indians bursting from ambush upon an unsuspecting foe. The northern pickets were driven in like leaves before a whirlwind. The rattle and then the crash of rifles beat upon the ears, and the southern horsemen were galloping through the streets of the startled village by the time the northern commander, posted with his main force just behind the town, knew that Jackson had emerged from the wilderness and was upon him. Banks, not dreaming of Jackson's nearness, had taken away Kenley's cavalry, and there were only pickets to see. The northern commander was brave and capable. He drew up his men rapidly on a ridge and planted his guns in front, but the storm was too heavy and swift. Harry saw the front of the southern army burst into fire, and then a deadly sleet of shell and bullets was poured upon the northern force. He and Dalton did not have time to rejoin Jackson but they kept with sherborne's force as the group of wild horsemen swung around toward the northern rear intending to cut it off harry heard the southern bugles playing mellow and triumphant tunes and they inflamed his brain all the little pulses in his head began to beat heavily millions of black specks danced before his eyes but the air about them was red he began to shout with the others the famous rebel yell which had in it the menacing quality of the indian war-whoop was already rolling from the half-circle of the attacking army as it rushed forward. 
Kenley hung to his ground, fighting with the courage of desperation, and holding off for a little while the gray masses that rushed upon him, when he heard that the cavalry of Sherborne was already behind him, and was about to gain a position between him and the river, he retreated as swiftly as he could, setting fire to all his tents and stores, and thundering in good order with his remaining force over the bridge. These northern men, New Yorkers largely, were good material, like their brethren of Ohio and West Virginia. Despite the surprise and the overwhelming rush of Jackson, they stopped to set fire to the bridge, and they would have closed that avenue of pursuit had not the Acadians rushed forward, heedless of bullets and flames, and put it out. Yet the bridge was damaged, and the southern pursuit could cross but slowly. Kenley, seeing his advantage, and cool and ready, drew up his men on a hill and poured a tremendous fire upon the bridge. Harry saw the daring deed of the men from the Gulf Coast, and he clapped his hands in delight. But he had only a moment's view. Sherborne was curving away in search of a ford, and all his men galloped close behind him. Near the town, the river was deep and swift, and the horsemen would be swept away by it. But willing villagers, running at the horses' heads, led them to fords farther down. "'Into the river, boys!' shouted Sherborne, as he, with Harry and Dalton by his side, galloped into the stream. It seemed to Harry that the whole river was full of horsemen in an instant. And then he saw Stonewall Jackson himself riding Little Sorrel into the stream. Harry's horse stumbled once on the rocky bottom, but recovered his footing, and the boy urged him on toward the bank bumping on either side against those who were as eager as he. He was covered with water and foam, churned up by so many horses. But he did not notice it. In a minute his horse put his four feet upon the bank, pulled himself up, and then they were all formed up by Jackson himself for the pursuit. "'They run! They run already!' cried Sherborne. They were not running exactly, but Kenley, always alert and cool, had seen the passage of the ford by the Virginians, and unlimbering his guns, was retreating in good order, but swiftly, his rear covered by the New York cavalry. Now Harry saw all the terrors of war. It was not sufficient for Jackson to defeat the enemy. He must follow and destroy him. More of his army crossed at the fords, and more poured over the bridge. The New York cavalry, despite courage and tenacity, could not withstand the onset of superior numbers. They were compelled to give way, and Kenley ordered his infantry, retreating on the turnpike, to turn and help them. Jackson had not waited for his artillery, but his riflemen poured volley after volley of bullets upon the beaten army, while his cavalry, galloping in the fields, charged it with sabers on either flank. Harry was scarcely conscious of what he was doing. He was slashing with his sword and shooting with the rest. Sometimes his eyes were filled with dust and smoke, and then again they would clear. He heard the voices of officers shouting to both cavalry and infantry to charge, and then there was a confused and terrible melee. Harry never remembered much of that charge, and he was glad that he did not. He preferred that it should remain a blur in which he could not pick out the details. He was conscious of the shock when horse met horse and body met body. He saw the flash of rifle and pistol shots and the gleam of sabers through the smoke and he heard a continuous shouting kept up by friend and foe. Then he felt the northern army, struck with such terrific force, giving way. Kenley had made a heroic stand, but he could no longer support the attacks from all sides. One of his cannon was taken, and then all. He himself fell wounded terribly. His senior officers also fell as they tried to rally their men, who were giving way at all points. Sherborne wheeled his troops away again and charged at the northern cavalry, which was still in order. Harry had seen Jackson himself give the command to the captain. It was the redoubtable commander who saw all and understood all, who always struck with his sword directly at the weak point in the enemy's armor. Harry saw that eye glittering as he had never seen it glitter before, and the command was given in words of fire that communicated a like fire to every man in the troop. The northern cavalry cut to pieces, Kenley's whole army dissolved, the attack was so terrific, so overwhelming, and was pushed home so hard, that panic ran through the ranks of those brave men. They fled through the orchards and fields, and Jackson never ceased to urge on the pursuit, taking whole companies here and there, and seizing scattered fugitives. 
Ashby, with the chief body of the cavalry, galloped on ahead to a railway station where Pennsylvania infantry were on guard. They had just got ready a telegraphic message to Banks for help, but his men rushed the station before it could be sent, tore up the railroad tracks, cut the telegraph wires, carried by storm a log house in which the Pennsylvanians had taken refuge, and captured them all. The northern army had ceased to exist. Save for some fugitives, it had all fallen or was in the hands of Jackson, and the triumphant cheers of the southerners rang over the field. Banks at Strasburg, not far away, did not know that Kenley's force had been destroyed. Three hours after the attack had been made, an orderly, covered with dust, galloped into his camp, and told him that Kenley was pressed hard. He did not know the full truth himself. Banks, whose own force was cut down by heavy drafts to the eastward, was half incredulous. It was impossible that Jackson could be at Front Royal. He was fifty or sixty miles away, and the attack must be some cavalry raid, which would soon be beaten off. He sent a regiment and two guns to see what was the matter. He telegraphed later to the Secretary of War at Washington that a force of several thousand rebels gathered in the mountains was pushing Kenley hard. End of chapter 9, part 1